these days when people measure data, they say we have the data, we are collecting the data, then everyone says, okay, you know what you're doing, which is not necessarily the case. And But the point is to enforce what you call epistemic closure. Epistemy is the word for knowledge. So anytime you hear anything to, to uh, that mentions epistem, it has to do with knowledge. So you have epistemology, study of knowledge, um, epistemic relating to knowledge. So epistemic closure is when, uh, when a concept is men mentioned, you say, oh, it's technology. Then I have no more questions. You've closed the conversation, basically. So that's what happens with technology. It's what happens with God. It's what happens with science. And now it's the same thing happening with data. So, you know, uh, for example, when Huduma Namba was first uh, proposed, in fact, even up to now, the argument is, oh, there's a number, there's technology, there's big, no, there's big data, ah, then everything is okay. End of conversation. If you start asking other questions, you're told you're against big data or you're, you're not, you're against technology or you're not, uh, with, you're not uh, up to date. Yeah, and so, so that is what is happening with, with science. Science, technology, law, all these things that come from institutions, once they are measure, mentioned, this epistemic closure, we are not allowed to ask any more questions. Um, and that's what happens in uh, public conversation. I don't know. You know, I, I think of, of, of uh, census. Whenever I think of census, I think of the story of Jesus. Because when he was being born, his parents had to go to birth to Bethlehem to be counted by the Roman Empire. Um, I don't know. I, I would have to research on that, the, the philosophy of census. But personally, as an African, I, I, I don't like that idea of counting people. Um, it's a taboo in our cultures to count. You, you're not supposed to count people. So already for me, that breaks something uh, psychically. In my soul, it breaks something. But also what, what censuses do, and in fact, actually, we are going to talk about this. What censuses do is the same thing elections do. Once you start counting the numbers, it brings division, and, and bitterness, um, and that's now what happened with, what was it, there was a quarrel about the budgeting the other time, the one, mil, eh? one, man, one man, one vote, one shilling. That debate just the other day, it was based on the census. So people look at the census, they say, the amount of money we should allocate to anywhere where should be based on the, on the number of people in that area. I mean, of course, it's going to bring conflict. So numbering actually always brings conflict. And it's so interesting because that's what uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about in our, in our, in our clips for, for today. It's about elections and why do numbers create so much animosity? Why do they create so much conflict? So I think census falls in that area because you reduce people to numbers, you don't take care, which was, and then you don't take care of their history, their legacy, their social conditions, the inequality. You say, um, we are not going to consider all that. We're just going to look at the numbers because the numbers don't lie. Numbers lie. In fact, they lie more than anything because you're just looking at one aspect of people. You reduce people's history and humanity to a number, and then you allocate resources on that basis. It's so evil. I mean, it's not even evil, it's taboo. That is African taboo. We, we, we are not supposed to think of people like that. But because we've brought these crazy systems, that's why we, we look at people as numbers and equate them to shillings and say that that's how we are going to do policy. And, and the best argument against that, uh, which was what I was saying last time, is not to dispute the numbers. It's to question that the logic 
of reducing people to numbers. Because if, even if you reduce a hardship area which has a low population to numbers, what are you saying about those people? Are they not human beings like everybody else? Uh, the kind of things we accept, our ancestors are, must be wondering what is wrong with us. Anyway, so the first um, video I'm going to show you, now bringing back the numbers and the idolatry of numbers is a tyranny of numbers. I want you to watch this video of Mutahiguni, the great, the wonderful, ever intelligent. Mutahiguni telling people about tyranny of numbers. Remember, this is between, before the 2013 elections, not the 2017. I want you to observe not just not just listen to what he says, but observe everything. The situation, the, the, the props or whatever you call it, who is interviewing, what are the journalists saying in terms of before and after the interview, um, what questions do they ask, all that, because that's how we are going to look at conversations. So um, let me just play it and then you see. Political scientists have time and again insisted that politics is a game of numbers and that elections are won or lost, depending on the number of supporters a candidate has in a certain region. So could the March 4th general election have been won or lost as soon as the electoral body IEBC concluded the voter registration exercise in December? Political scientist Mutahi Nguni has a hypothetical look at what he calls the tyranny of numbers. And here are the figures. And why we call this a tyranny of numbers is because this election was won actually on December 18th. That's when it was, the conduct, it was conducted in one month and the results were announced on December 18th when IEBC closed the numbers, the voter registration, and said the following number of people have been registered. And uh, some people slept through registration as they were doing razzmatazz on the streets, doing their rallies, while as others actually skimmed through registration. That's the reason why some communities have registered extra, you know, uh, very, very big numbers, and others have registered almost uh, uh, inconsequential numbers. And as a result, you can see that some community will actually tyrannize if there is any word like that, the other uh, communities during the voting process. Ngunye, in his hypothetical analysis based on the raw numbers of the registered voters, suggests that the Jubilee Coalition has a head start since the two main regions considered to be its main support base, that is the Mount Kenya region and Rift Valley, have the highest number of registered voters as compared to the areas where Kod is perceived to enjoy its largest support, that is Nyanza and parts of Eastern. The, 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 the difficulty in this election is not who will win or who will lose. The difficulty in this uh, election is in ensuring, especially for Raila, that Jubilee does not win this election round one. And I say so because when you look at the 50, point, uh, 50 plus 1 percent threshold, which is 7.1 million votes, uh, and you look at the Jubilee support, which is 6.2 million votes, they are short of the threshold by only 980,000. Uh, votes, if, if voting will be 100%. Well, as if you look at the code, they are 2.8 million ethnic blocks being the Kamba and the Luo, 2.8 million votes only. The difference is 4.3 million votes to reach the 50 plus 1 percent, which therefore means that code has to work four times more than Jubilee to be able to reach that particular threshold. Nguni argues that historically, Kenyans vote on ethnic lines and that the March 4th presidential contest may be no exception. No matter what strategy he applies now, it is late for him because the election was won a long time ago. His only strategy for now is not to try and break into those strongholds, as it were, but to try and stop these guys from winning round one. And he has to do that by ensuring that the court fellows come out to vote to the last man. Because if voter turnout is low in the court areas, the chances of Raila becoming number three are very high. Musalia Mudavadi could just become number two. 
And that would provide for serious political comedy, in my view, which would also be very pathetic. It's because he slept through the evolution. And looking at the voter registration figures across the country, Nguni argues that the crimes against humanity charges that Kenyatta and Ruto face at the ICC could have been the driving force in the voter registration turnout in the Jubilee strongholds. The House of Gamer in particular was annoyed when they went to register. They registered with Fujo. IEBC expected them to register a certain number. They hit that number and went beyond. Because almost all the Kikuyu strongholds and uh, the Mbwe and the Meru strongholds are at 100% plus plus. Kiambu alone is at 113%. Uh, others are 104, 109. And the same thing in the Kalenjin areas. And I think the ICC is what drove these people. You know, the, 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 the desire to protect their own. And that's why the record must reflect that if Uhuru becomes president and Ruto his deputy, it is because of Kofi Annan. That the Anam process and the ICC process are what then cost everybody, the ethnic groups to regiment around their own as a way of protecting them. And I think this is what these figures are telling us. Opinion pollsters have consistently ranked Odinga as the man to beat in the March 4th race to State House. If he continues to delude himself through the polls that he is ahead and he fails to pay attention to the raw figures on the ground and work with them, he will slip through this election. What he must do, in my view, is that he must work very hard to stop um, Uhuru and Ruto from winning round one. That should be his only strategy, because then that will give him an opportunity to get into the runoff, and it will help him regroup with the other groups, the other communities, and do a good fight during the runoff. Critics of Nguni's hypothesis have argued that there will be many dynamics that will influence the March 4th presidential outcome and that not all people from Kenyatta's, Ruto's and Mudavadi's communities will vote in one defined direction. Ultimately, it's the 14.3 million registered voters who will have the final say on who becomes Kenya's fourth president on March 4th at the ballot. Francis Gashori, Citizen Live at 9. <laughs> Okay, your thoughts. Oh dear. Hindsight is so interesting. You start seeing things which you hadn't seen. You know, this is not just a mathematics lesson. It's because the stakes are so high. The emotional uh, pool makes the numbers even more serious. But you see people think, it's like, I have to concentrate. Let me concentrate on the mathematics. But it's not the mathematics that's being, being appealed to, it's the emotion. The emotion of feeling that this is high stakes. Okay, um, but let me just play a refutal of, of that, a rebuttal to that, uh, that, 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 um, that argument. I don't want to play the whole uh, eight minutes, so I'm just going to play the conclusion and then you can, I, I can share the link and then you can watch the whole thing. In conclusion, first, all Kenyans do not vote only for candidates from their own ethnic groups. Second, we do not know the ethnic identities of registered voters. Third, Raila Odinga is already in office and studies show that that position gives him an advantage in the election. Fourth, Voter turnout in Kenya has never been 100%. And fifth, Guni's mistakes show that Jubilee clearly cannot be assured of a first round victory and a runoff is highly likely. For more information, please click on the following link. Thank you. Like I was saying, the weakness of this rebuttal, and you'll watch it later, the weakness of this rebuttal is that it's stuck to the numbers. It's stuck to the, to the what do you call it? To the basis of what Mut Mutahiguni is arguing. So Mutahiguni was arguing that um, all the people in Gema will vote Jubilee, all the people in, uh, in Nyanza will vote Kod. And the assumption there was that all ethnic groups vote for one, one person to a man, yeah. and et cetera, and et cetera. But what was disturbing about this, um, 
what do you call the way he was arguing is that he was he was not arguing about the present he was also presenting a strategy for 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 the for the future for the election day itself because when he says that um everybody uh, when he says that everybody from Gema came to register because they were angry about IC. I don't believe that. I don't believe it. No, I don't think there was any anger. So what, what he did, and that was the danger. And oh God, what he was doing was to talk about the present, giving a future uh, strategy, but talking about it as in it is already done. So he was saying that everybody came out of ICC uh, because they were angry with ICC. But actually, that was the argument of the victory later on. That was the argument of the victory that people came out to vote because they were angry with ICC. That was what happened. So, oh God. So it's, it's actually a preparation for violence because now you force people to come out which was what happened in, in central areas. People were not being given an option, they were being carried on back so I told to go and vote. So what he was saying was a spontaneous reaction of anger, was actually a strategy to mobilize. That was the dishonesty of it. It was so dishonest. And then even when he says, um, we are going, uh, when, when he's arguing with the assumption that people are going to vote to a man from their ethnic group. That's a preparation for politicians to, to use violence because now the politicians go to the, the they, they use violence to force the members of their ethnic group to vote in a certain way. And to say that people from another ethnic group will not vote in that way. So it's a preparation for violence, the way he was talking, it was so irresponsible. But nobody challenged him. And, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, where? That's what I want to talk about, the fallacies and the manipulations of that whole theater. And I'm calling it theater deliberately because next week we'll talk about um, the importance of understanding uh, genres of literature like theater, melodrama, tragedy, those things, how they are important to understand the way emotions and stories are used to manipulate or to talk about public. So, um, first of all, the, the, this, this, uh, this, what do you call it, this video of Mutahiguni begins with, Hey, let me just share it again so that we can see. The deco, whoa, fabulous. He's wearing a tie, looking very, you know, there's a part even now, you know, I was saying the way he does his hands together. Let me just, there's a part where he's uh, not there. Let me put it there. You know, very calm, controlled. He's, he's talking technical things. This is not about how we feel about politicians and their agendas. It's, it's the numbers. Yeah? You can see. And then there are books over there just to confirm that, yeah, it's about the analysis. And you can even see uh, Citizen called it analysis. And it was drama. It was better. It was an analysis. Anyway, okay. So there's the, there's the, the dress. The dress is the, the, acted as props. The dress, the books, the way he's seated. It acted as props to give an authority to what he is saying. Political scientists have time and again insisted that politics is a game of numbers and that elections are won or lost depending on the number of supporters a candidate has in a certain region. Uh, you see, he starts with political scientists. That's the other thing of closing off the public. He closes off the public by saying, uh, you know, this is an authority. 
It's from the university, political analyst, it's science, it comes from the books and you know, somebody touching the ring. Yani, who are you to ask anything? It's already been decided by people who know better. There's so much authority that is already being pushed at the public. First, you're told political scientists, and you see this guy sitting with a tie and books behind him talking very calmly. So it's already sort of like you're being chased into believing what he's saying. Um, and then, hey, what was so dishonest about the journalists is that they, they said it was hypothetical, but they were reporting it as a fact. So even though he said at the beginning it's hypothetical, I don't know if you noticed, like during the the where, where you have the close up, where you have the picture in the office with the journalist, it's very calm. So if it's hypothetical, there should be a debate, there should be questions. But instead, it's an interview, and the, the journalists are just sitting back listening to this guy. Let me just show the picture again. This doesn't look like a hypothesis situation. It's not a discussion of a hypothesis and a testing of a hypothesis. It's a book bookman with books in his head who is now telling the journalist what it shall be. And you'll notice that at the end of the video, they just mentioned critics said, I don't know what, what, what. But there was no equal time given to the critics to punch through that hypothesis. Hey, we were really duped. Um, then there's something else he does. Hey, gosh, Aki Kenya. The, then there was another thing he said, this argument he makes of, of that it's Kofi Annan who decided the election. This is an appeal to, or the, it's the ICC that pushed people to, to uh, go and register to vote in the Gema areas. This is an appeal to being told, you know, Kenyans, the way we worship the international community, everything international, we are there trying to compete and show how great we are. It's an appeal to that. It's an appeal to, this thing is, it's so obvious, it's even obvious internationally. You know, even the inter there's an international impetus. So in case you, you're there thinking of your local school or your local dispensary, eh, there are bigger issues which are being debated here, international ones, ICC. That's what these people are thinking about and that's how they will vote on ICC. It's utter rubbish. And we accepted it. Closure, remember, epistemic closure. The, the matter is closed. So, and, and this, again, was the second time when Mutahi Gunyi is talking about the present, when actually he's talking about a future argument that would be made. And the future argument was, oh, the results are obvious. People were annoyed with ICC, that's why they voted that way. So he's preempting, he's preempting those arguments that were going to be made ahead by saying these things as if they were a done deal. Oh, Ati Kenyans going to vote because of international people since when? But then also, it, it was also an appeal to the idea of the, the Gema communities having fought for against the Wazungu. So it was, it was such a double narrative, which was what Cambridge Analytica was saying. They just dipped into the well. They dipped into it. They dipped into the well of, of this narrative of, oh, we got independence because Mau Mau fought and the Kikuyus are the ones who fought. They dipped into that well. So people went to the polls thinking, I'm doing it against imperialism to GICC. And then the rest of Kenya accepted the narrative. We, we all bought it. We hate, even those who hated it still bought it. They never said, what are these guys doing? They're manipulating our emotions and our trauma and creating a narrative to justify a result. Anyway, um, the, the other thing I want, okay, the other interesting thing about this, uh, this whole story was that he was basically saying, 
even though <laughs> it was very interesting, the whole clip was about what God should do. And, and what, what the what TNA uh, Jubilee had already done was taken as, as obvious. So now it's called to catch up. They're the ones to catch up. They're the ones who are sleeping. And by the way, even court supporters said the same thing after the results. They believed it. They believed it. So um, it, it's called to do the work. They're the ones to catch up. They should stop sleeping. They should look for their voters. And I don't know what. And they don't have, basically it was muscle flexing and being told, you don't have ethnic groups the way Jubilee has. Imagine, and you see what that did was again epistemic closure. It made Kenyans believe that it is natural to vote on, on tribal lines. They believed it. In fact, people these days say it like it's a truism. In fact, uh, uh, in fact, the journalist said uh, historically Kenyans vote on ethnic lines. But is that really true? And this was what uh, a magazine called the Jacobin asked, because they were saying, if you look at the marginalized areas, they are populated by a certain ethnic group. So they may be, be voting for against economic marginalization, but the pundits and the political analy analysts and the media, they read it as it was tribe. And they never go to ask. Why are you voting against this and this? They never see it because it's supposed to be obvious. We never vote on anything else but our tribe. It's an epistemic closure. So there are so many closures when it comes to elections, so many places where we are not allowed to ask questions. Um, and then, so at the end of the day, my point here is, Elections are not about the numbers, they're about the narratives. And the point of this tyranny of numbers was to provide a narrative. Uh, the narrative was provided and after that, everybody started analyzing whatever was happening according to that narrative. And it was a powerful narrative because of the way it was staged. It was staged with the theatrics books, it was made to look um, yeah. dispassionate, it was made to look like calculations which you can't even understand. And then people accepted that narrative and going forward, that was what we all believed. So even if we voted how the narrative would have explained any result using that, that narrative. And that's what you're seeing with, uh, what's his name? Trump. He already started creating the narratives even before the police stations were closed started saying mail ballots, gee, I don't know what is wrong with those. The narratives were, and in fact, Bernie Sanders predicted what he would do, that he would start declaring his president. And then when more ballots come in, uh, being counted, he would say, actually, those are fake ballots. I am president, what are these people doing? I have the Supreme Court, let's go to court. So elections are about narratives. And I think that is the one thing we Kenyans have to understand. We have to look at the narratives and stop focusing on the numbers. The numbers alone don't say every, everything. And you remember what we saw with Kathy O'Neill last week. She was saying, these numbers are saying other stories. If elections are about narratives rather than the numbers, or is it in addition to whatever? If the main thing of elections is the narratives, why are we so pulled into talking about numbers? And this is what I want to suggest. Eh? I want to suggest that uh, the problem is not even the numbers and the results. It's the psychology that the, the hysteria that is created because there's something to win. When there's something to win, people lose their minds. They lose their minds, they start focusing on the numbers, they trash everything and every sacrifice everything because of those numbers. And that's what we do at elections. We are told to focus on the numbers and we, we, we trash our relationships, we kill each other, we abuse one another because of numbers. 
because we, we are told not to focus on the narratives, we are told to focus on the numbers. So whenever there's something to win, people stop thinking. They stop thinking. And it's a psychosis, in my view, it's a, it's a form of psychosis. Um, so for example, and, and this is not just about uh, elections, it's also about gambling, for example. What pulls people to keep on um, betting and betting away their life, their fees, their what, destroying their relationships? It's the, number, it's the, it's the winning. Again, the, the, the psychology. It's the desire to win at the expense of everything else that keeps pushing people to bet and bet and bet, even when they don't have any more resources to bet with, they continue betting because of that thrill that you get from winning. Examinations are the same. You know, we obsess and obsess until it is like, I mean, sometimes I look at parents and I wonder, are you mad? You know, we obsess so much with the kid getting a certain grade or being a certain number. And we forget whether the mental health of the child is okay, whether they are, whether it, this, this academics is stressing them. We forget all that because of the thrill of the number. We must get, the kid must get a certain number in the exam because numbers means winning. And what do we do when KCSE results come out or KCP? We are there singing and dancing because of numbers. So this thrill of victory, this psychosis of victory is not only just about elections. We have made it go to the rest of society. All our other relationships are breaking down because we want the thrill of numbers. Numbers, numbers, numbers. And the numbers lie. 